The last two videos covered Class A amplifiers and their efficiency. And we talked about capacitive coupling of a Class A amplifier, in which we could get only a maximum 25% efficiency. And also the transformer coupled amplifier, Class A again, in which we were able to get just about to 50% uh, in a theoretical value, but in a practical level, of course, it's going to be quite a bit less. This time around, we are going to talk about the Class B amplifiers and the Class AB amplifiers. And with these, we can get efficiencies of almost 79%. Recall that in a Class A amplifier, when we were dealing with a load line, and this would be the load line for the circuit over here, in a Class A amplifier, we want to bias it in the middle so the output can match the input. Remember, we have really good fidelity on a Class A amplifier. If we have a, it's centered in the middle of the load line, and we have a sine wave coming in, we would also have, on that output, a sine wave there. We get 360 degrees of output for 360 degrees of input. The problem with this is that is the poor efficiency. It's great fidelity, but poor efficiency. So what we can do is move our cue point down the load line, and this actually improves efficiency when there's no input signal. Remember, there, when there's an input, even when there's no input signal on a Class A amplifier, it's consuming power. With no input signal on a Class B amplifier, it, it has no power consumption. But the bad thing is that now we start to lose fidelity. What we're going to end up with an output for this particular model is, so we still, we still have a, a NPN transistor. So imagine we have that 8-volt peak-to-peak signal coming in. And there's our, our ground level, so it's a signal that looks like this. Because there's no biasing network on the input of the transistor, we don't have those values for RB1 and RB2. Those aren't present. The input signal is what actually has to supply the turn-on voltage for the transistor. Well, the typical transistor, again, we just model that as being a, about a 0.7-volt uh, turn-on. It's going to take 0.7 volts of the input signal before we ever get an output. So the output is only going to be on for a half cycle. Well, that, and that's because, well, what happens when we go to the negative half cycle? The voltage here becomes negative. That reverse biases this junction, puts it in the cutoff, and we have absolutely no output at this point. So what we look at is a an attenuated, it's a slightly lower by 700 millivolts signal on the on the positive alternation using a NPN, and no output at all on the on the negative alternation. It's extremely efficient. Again, about, almost 79 percent but it has extremely poor fidelity. So let's go ahead and take a look at a, this actual circuit in operation, and then we'll see how we can improve it to include both parts of the, of the sine wave, and perhaps uh, bias it a little bit better to eliminate part of the losses that we have because of that base emitter turn-on voltage. This is the circuit that I was just showing you, and here's my transistor, and this time I'm just using a 2N2222, it's still an NPN, um, just to use a different component. I have uh, my current limiting resistor and feedback resistor on the emitter to set the maximum amount of current. My input is coming in on the base of the transistor. This is going to be a common collector. So the collector is going to be at uh, VCC, and the emitter is going to be our output. And I'm taking it unloaded. I don't have any, any resistor hooked up out here. Just to show you a best situation you can have kind of example. And there's the output signal. And the blue trace is the 
output, and the purple trace is the input signal. You can see it's a, about 8 volts peak to peak, and I've overlaid the, the ground points roughly. And you can see that that little spot right there, where the it doesn't overlap exactly, well, that's that's how long it took for the signal to get to that 7 tenths of a volt to turn on the base to the emitter junction. And because we had to drop that 0.7 volts, notice that the peak is always going to be about 0.7 volts less than, than uh, the input value. So the difference between these two points, if we were to overlay them on the on the center of our scope at one volt per division so we're looking at approximately 0.2 volts for each one of these uh, for one of these little subdivisions so starting at zero there's 0 0.2 0 0.4 0 0.6 0 0.8 and then one so starting here we have 0 0.2 0 0.4 0 0.6 so we have roughly 0 0.6 volts for the turn on and you can see that as far as fidelity is concerned, we're not very close. We're, uh, we've chopped up the entire p bottom portion of this wave, and we've taken a portion of the output wave and used it to turn the transistor on, which has, although it increases efficiency, decreases the fidelity or the reproduction of the original signal. So now we have to figure out a way to get that signal to look like the output signal to look like the original input signal, and this is how we would do that. So well, this is our new and improved Class B amplifier. It really isn't the most efficient of the Class B amplifiers because I put a divider network on this device to put a, a slight bias voltage on the base of these transistors. If I were really trying to go for efficiency, I would eliminate this network entirely and just let the 8 volt peak signal at the input, 8 volt peak to peak signal, turn the transistors on and off. But the closer I want to get to having that really good fidelity, uh, I really need a, a slight voltage on that, the base of each one of these transistors to improve the output in comparison to the original input signal. So what I'm doing here is I, I'm using what's called a complementary symmetry. And complementary symmetry just means I'm using an NPN and a PNP. In this circuit, we're going to have a, a small voltage on the base of each one of these transistors. And that voltage can be determined by just using a voltage divider equation. So we could just say, all right, let's, let's look at uh, what's the voltage that these two bases are going to have to share. Well, it's the combination of the voltage from these two 680 ohm resistors. And we end up with uh, 13... 60 ohms for these two resistors over a total of the entire string. Remember, we're just interested in what the value is on these two. So that would be 21,360. And then we multiply it by the 10 volts, and we're going to get about 636 millivolts on the base. So 0.636 volts. Well, remember, these two resistors, they have to share that voltage. And in a perfect world, they would share it equally. So we would have 318 millivolts on this base and 318 millivolts on this base. Now, what that's going to give us is we have to use less of our input signal to turn the transistor on because it already has some small bias voltage. And these resistors are relatively large. They could have been made much larger, but I wanted to keep them here to show you what, ha what impact they have on, on circuit efficiency. Well, these two 318 millivolt uh, voltages uh, give a little bit of bias to the signal at the on the base of each one of the transistors. On the positive alternation, Q1 is going to conduct, and so we're going to get a, an output here, and it's going to be 318 millivolts. Remember, this still needs the 0.7, so we're looking at, we're going to chop off about 400 millivolts of the bottom of this signal. So we're going to lose about 400 millivolts on the bottom of the signal. And the same is going to be true on this, on the, the next alternation. When Q2, when the, when the signal goes negative, Q2 gets biased on, Q1 is off, we get the negative portion of the signal, and again we're going to lose about 400 millivolts. And the output then will look like a little 
little bit like that, and I'll show you that shortly on the on the OSCO. If I had not put this value on uh, the the cutoffs, the the missing part of the signal would have been even greater. So we might have just gone to this point and then over here, and we'd have lost more of the original signal. So fidelity goes down. The problem with adding these the biasing resistors is that it really impacts efficiency. And we're going to talk about that in, in just a second. The biasing resistors make efficiency go down, but they improve the fidelity. All right, so let's just make a, a few predictions about the output signal that we are going to see here. Again, it should be if we're doing 8 volts peak to peak, so we're going to have a 4 volt positive peak and a 4 volt negative peak give us our 4 volts at peak to peak we are going to chop off about 0.4 volts off of each one so we would estimate that our outputs should be 3.6 volts peak to 3.6 volts peak Remember, we've got that 318 millivolts. It takes the 700 millivolts to turn this on. So we only have to take 400 millivolts from the input signal to, to get an output. And we, you know, we have a fairly, fairly good looking signal at the output. Again, uh, I didn't mention it earlier. This is a, a common collector. Remember that the collector is uh, at DCC or at the ground potential, depending on whether we're using PNP or NPN and the output signal should match pretty much what the input signal is as far as voltage uh, gain which is which should be none should be a very slight loss and but we should have a current gain now given those parameters we should have an output signal that looks something like this and here's a view of the output from the circuit the yellow trace is the input wave, and you can see that at 1 volt per division, we're going 8 divisions, so we have 8 volts peak to peak. I've overlaid the ground points here, and you can see at ground, there's a slight bit of what's called crossover distortion. And crossover distortion is caused by the turn-on voltage that the transistors require. And you can see the, the slight uh, difference in the amplitudes between the, the input signal and the output signal. And that should be about 400 millivolts or, or two divisions. You can see here we're at 500 millivolts per division on, on each one of the traces, on each channel. We've got our grounds uh, roughly overlaid. And you can see the difference in the amplitude at 500 millivolts per division is about eight divisions. So we're again looking at about uh, about 400 millivolts, which corresponds exactly with what we should have had because of the slight bias voltage that we had in the circuit. And I almost overlooked testing the the bias voltages on the complementary symmetry amplifier for the class B. And in this one. These two resistors should provide about 636 millivolts between the two of them. And ideally, we'd like to see that shared uh, equally between our, our NPN and our PNP. And if we check from base to emitter, we can see that the NPN has 309 millivolts and the PNP measure right point has 341 millivolts. So they aren't sharing it equally. The, the, the PNP is taking a little bit more of the input voltage to do the turn on. Nevertheless, uh, it does it decrease the crossover distortion. As I mentioned earlier, the maximum theoretical efficiency of this circuit is a little bit over 78.5%. When we include a biasing network, as, as I've done here, you're actually going to lose some efficiency. If I had eliminated this biasing network and let the 
8 volt peak to peak input signal due to the, the biasing of the transistor then we would be able to get that 78.5 percent efficiency uh, but for right now let's just go through this circuit and imagine that this bias network is not there and see how they came up with that 78 and a half percent efficiency as you probably remember from the previous videos if you've watched them you know that eta is a measure of the efficiency of a circuit given the uh, power out in RMS divided by the uh, power that the DC supply had to had to give to the circuit and we'd like to get power out to be equal to power DC that's not going to happen no circuit is uh, perfectly efficient we're always going to lose something in the form of heat the way this calculation is done then uh, you'll remember, and this is an AC uh, point, that uh, voltage out, if it's a peak value, you multiply it by 0 0.707 to get RMS. And we have to have all of our AC powers in RMS because what we're trying to do is compare heating effect through equivalent resistors. And that's what RMSN and power DC are. This is equivalent heating effects. So we have to take those peak values, multiply them by 0 0.707. And you may remember that if we take 0 0.707 and multiply it by 0 0.707, we actually end up with 0.5. Well, the funny thing about this circuit is that the value for VCEQ, the voltage from collector to emitter at the Q point, is only going to be at a maximum half of VCC because these transistors have to split that voltage that is applied here. When we split that voltage, that 0 0.707 times 0 0.707, which gives us 0.5, where we split that power, whatever the case may be, we end up dividing that 0.5 by 2, so we end up with a maximum of 0 0.2 5 as a multiplier. Well, 0.25 of that of a multiplier is going to give us a pretty small value. So we're, we're plugging this 0.25, and that's where that 0.25 came from in this calculation. So it's 0 0.707 times 0 0.707 gave us 0 0.5. Dividing it by 2 because we're only using half of half of the uh, value of VCC, and and that's just been we've just taken that 0 0.25 and, and put it into one equation instead of, of, of dividing VCC by 2. It's either way, it's, it, the math is still the same. So 0.25 IC sat times VCC. Well, what's IC sat? IC sat, is a, the saturation, is going to be 5 volts divided by the 1.2K ohm resistor. And that's going to give us a current of 400 and... or 4.17 milliamps. So we have 4.17 milliamps times our VCC value. So that's our SAT times our VCC value. That's 10 volts. And then we have to multiply the whole thing by 0.25. And we're going to end up with a power out RMS of about 10.43 milliwatts. All right, so that's the that's our our RMS power or our output power. What power did we need to actually get this to the output? In that case, we're just using IC sat and multiplying it by VCC, but notice that we're dividing this by pi. Because the output on these transistors is actually going to be follow a half of a uh, one alternation of a sine wave, if you remember that this peak value, if we're trying to get this to be a DC value, this, this half of a sine wave to be a DC value, it was voltage peak divided by pi. And if it was two waves, remember, it was two times voltage peak divided by pi. So that's where that pi comes from, because we have to standardize or normalize a sine wave to that DC function. 
And what we'll end up with is, again, 4.17 times VCC, 10 volts, and I should put milliamps in here, so I'll just put milli. And we're going to divide this by pi, and the power that the supply had to deliver came out to be 13.18 milliwatts, which makes the efficiency of this circuit then, using power out divided by power DC, 10.43 milliwatts divided by 13.18 milliwatts. And we're actually going to end up with a little bit higher value than 78% uh, that we can normally end up with for this particular particular circuit. So we're, we're going to come up with about 78 or 7, a little bit over 78.5%. So let's, uh, I believe it was 78.6% efficiency. All right. So let's go back to what the maximum efficiency can be. So we said that we, we all agreed that the 0.25 IC set times VCC was the power out RMS. And we also found that if we take IC set times VCC and divide it by pi, that's the power input. If we do a little bit of algebra and we start canceling out IC sets and VCCs and all that, and then you know, do a little transposition, etc., you're going to end up with 0.25 times pi as a result for the maximum efficiency. So taking 0.25 times pi, we end up with 78. 0.539 percent, and then there's a few more decimal points out there. Um, so let, let's go ahead and really quickly just plug this in and see what we get. So we get 10.43 divided by the 13.18, and according to the numbers, I actually come up with 79.14 percent, which can't happen. It can't be higher than the theoretical value. So we got this because of some rounding that I did. Uh, to get these values. Alright, so that's how you get the theoretical value, and this is how we get the the, uh, the measured value, not including rounding error. So I should have gone out a few more decimal places. Well, what have we not included in here? These resistors, the base resistors, have a current flowing through them. And that current is just 10 volts divided by the sum of all of these resistors, and it's going to give us 468 microamps. Well, we have 10 volts across that 468 microamps, so we must obviously have 4.68 milliwatts of DC power being consumed here, which we have not included in this equation. Remember I said that you can only think of this as a, having this really, really high efficiencies if we don't have these biasing networks. You put the biasing network in there, and we start dropping power on it, the efficiency goes down. So correcting our, our calculations then to include this, we'll end up with 10.43 milliwatts. So that's our still our power out. And our power in is still going to be the 13.18 milliwatts. Uh, that was required essentially to get our output section over here. Plus we have the 4.68 milliwatts that we use to bias the circuit. And for this one, we're going to end up with an efficiency of 58.4%. So you can see how much effect that biasing network had on the actual output of, or the actual efficiency of this circuit. The easiest way to eliminate crossover distortion is by using what's called a current mirror. And a current mirror can be implemented by using a pair of diodes, D1 and D2. In this case, I'm using small signal diodes, uh, 1N914s, but you could use 1N4148s or DAW76s, whatever you like. And if we think about this as, 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 a, as a current mirror, so what is a current mirror? A current mirror is a device or a system that whatever current, whatever happens in one section, current-wise, 
is replicated in the other section. Any current that goes through D2 is going to go into the transistor, be multiplied beta times, and then we're going to have uh, a current change at the output. So if the current goes up here, the current goes up here. So it's a, it's actually just a mirror. If you want to think of it another way, just think of this transistor D2 as providing a 0.7 volt bias, which is exactly what's needed to turn on the base to emitter junction of each one of these transistors. And remember, we're, we're splitting these in half, uh, 1.4 volts across the entire section, uh, 0.7 volt for each one in a perfect world. It's not going to happen. One will probably take a little bit more than the other one. And the the implementation is, is as I said, you know, whatever happens current-wise in one is mirrored in the other one. So they, they're reflections of each other. And this current mirror helps to eliminate that crossover distortion. And because the bias on these diodes, if it's, you know, again, we're talking a perfect world, whatever... Uh, bias is required to get these diodes to conduct is also going to be the voltage or the bias current that's going to require these to turn on. This is the class AB amplifier and you can see I've eliminated RB2 and RB3 and replaced them with small signal diodes. And I'm still set up with my push-pull configuration and ideally uh, if I measure the voltage from base to the emitter, and I'm not observing polarity, I'm just giving a measurement, so you can see there's 0.54 volts on the 3904, and on the 3906 I've got 0.57, so these aren't perfectly matched transistors, but the diodes are going to do a great job of overcoming any deficiencies that we're going to have in the and the variability in these, and they also provide good temperature stability. As the temperature changes for, for both of these transistors, it of course changes for both of these diodes. And being, uh, you know, if, if they're matched ideally, the temperature coefficients match, and the current changes, and they should have a, a nice uh, steady symmetrical output in relation to each other to give us a good waveform. The output wave looks like this. And you almost cannot tell one from the other. You can see that there's still a, a little variation in the amplitude. And remember, this is a, a common collector circuit, so the output's always going to be a little bit less than the input. But if we really expand the sensitivity of our scope, you can't see any, any crossover distortion whatsoever. The, they're almost, uh, well, it's, it's invisible. And that's what your class AB amplifier should do. It should eliminate that crossover distortion so you have good symmetry between the positive and the negative transitions between the NPN and the PNP. And you should have a, a nice symmetrical output on, on both devices. And you should have a signal like that. And the amplifier efficiency, again, we're going to lose a little bit on the, on the biasing network. It's not going to be as bad as it was on the Class B push-pull, because if you think about this circuit, the current through this part of the circuit is going to be lower. You still got the 10 volts from end to end, but remember these two diodes have to get their voltage drops first, so we're going to get 1.4 volts, roughly, from each one of these. 1.4 volts from the 10 volts VCC divided by the 20k ohms of resistance we have. So the current is going to be slightly lower than it was on the class B. So the efficiency goes up a little bit. And it's a, it's a really great circuit for, for getting a, a nice symmetrical output, good fidelity, and good efficiency.